Um, so as Sean said, I am a GP in Melbourne and for the last three years, um, nearly three years, we've been running the low carb clinic as well. And um, it's, it's a really fantastic um, experience. I work with a really great dietitian there, Camilla Dahl, um, and uh, we, we work as a team and um, work together to implement low carbohydrate diets for all those things that we know that they work for. And um, we're really excited to have a new doctor, Nicoletta Fisicaro, who's joined us recently as well. Uh, so my talks today are going to be basically um, to, around type 2 diabetes and there's a couple of, couple of um, cases that I'll be presenting. And um, I guess I, I find this kind of interesting because it, they illustrate where um, sometimes uh, you know, low carb can be difficult to implement and then sometimes where you can have amazing results with low carbohydrate diets. The first one I called my eventual convert. And uh, he is a really lovely 64-year-old man who's had type 2 diabetes for about 10 years. And in that time, it's been nothing too severe in the sense that his HbA1c has only been ranging 6.6 .6 to 7.6. And um, he's, uh, been, he was on metformin and empoglyphosin, um, two diabetic agents. And um, I'd spoken to him over the last couple of years about the potential to going onto a low carbohydrate diet and the benefits that that could give to him, but he'd always been quite reluctant and for a variety of reasons had thought that's not quite right for me. Um, he said, look, thank you for the effort in trying to convince me, but really uh, I think I'll just stay how I am and um, I'll just keep taking my medications and that's what is going to work for me. Um, and I mean, on reflection, some of those barriers can be a challenge, you know, for a lot of people. And um, it can be, you know, perceived as, you know, some other of the speakers have said, you know, it can be perceived as being such a radical thing to do, to be removing carbohydrates from your diet. Um, obviously, you know, a lot of us know that that's not the case at all. But a lot of people really think that that is quite a almost bizarre notion. So to, um, for people to think that that's something that they could do for the rest of their life can be difficult. Um, and also, you know, I guess he, we had a good relationship and he, he, you know, I think trusted me as a GP, but um, there was nowhere in a guideline that he could go and look this up to say that, you know, it was a validated way for treating type 2 diabetes. So I guess he was always very reluctant because he was a fairly, um, liked to go by the rules. Um, and um, he, he really had faith in this, uh, you know, medical science and medications as a, as a treatment, as you know, you have a disease, you know, you have, you have that and you need to go and test it to get diagnosed and then you can get a tablet. The tablet's going to fix you and that's, that's a good thing, you know. And so he, he had a lot of faith in that, I think. So he thought, oh, I'll be fine. All good, doc, thanks. And another complication was that he had a child with an eating disorder, so he really didn't want to what he thought would be co complicate that whole food dynamic at home in that, you know, there'd be more need to think about some of those restrictions. And I guess, you know, with a, with a child who was already restricting, he didn't want to be, I guess, modeling some of that perceived restricting behavior too. So he just thought, I'll leave that. Um, these were his HbA1c readings and I've graphed it out over the course of um, a few years here. So you can sort of see where metformin was commenced and then he had a, a response to metformin and the empaglyphosin was added a bit over a year ago. <clears throat> And you see initially he had a bit of a response. His HbA1c went down from about 6.8 down to about 6.5. But then it actually came back up, even though he'd been taking his medications. And it was at that point, that's, what, that's when things changed for him. That was his kind of, I guess, inflection point where he thought, wow, you know, I'm on these medications. And maybe what that doctor had said, maybe that you're going to need more and more as time goes on, could be true. And this could be the beginning of that. And so... Um, much to my surprise, he actually said, um, okay, I know you have a dietitian who does this, send me to her. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and knowing that empaglyphosin can be dangerous in, potentially dangerous in ketogenic diets because it, there's a small but potentially fatal risk of developing um, ketoacidosis. I stopped that because, um, you know, realizing that we didn't want that risk um, and much to his surprise and much to my joy, uh, four months later, his HbA1c, despite being off a medication, stopping a medication, um, his HbA1c was lower than it had been for more than 10 years, down at 5.8. Um, yeah, so very, 
Very exciting. And so after that, those four months, uh, he's now enthusiastic. He's, he's a real convert. <laughs> he, uh, he has no desire to stop this. He, um, he actually, in his own words, is incredibly impressed by the ability of a low carbohydrate diet to normalize his blood glucose levels in a way that no other medication has. Uh, he also noticed that effortless weight loss, his energy, you know, is great. Um, he hadn't, didn't have a lot of lose weight to lose, but he'd lost 10 kilograms, which he really enjoyed. He liked having a flat stomach, which um, was a surprise and, and a joy to him. Uh, and um, so I've gone through those points. He's still on metformin, and, but I think that, you know, we're confident. These are early days. It's only been four months since that implementation. And I think he's going to come off metformin eventually. I've got no doubt about that. And, um, you know, we're, we're on the way to, to remission and um, getting that HbA1c down to less than 5.6 off medication. And I guess um, just coming back to, the, you know, what it was that changed his mind, I think on reflection, it was, um, I guess, the, I had, without, without being too kind of, you know, horrific, I had um, painted the picture of, of what diabetes in my education had, it was, and that was that it was this kind of palliative approach. Um, and I guess, um, try and bear with me for the next few minutes, it gets a bit dark, but it gets better <laughs> after that. So, you know, um, you could almost say the same things for cancer, you know, a, a, a cancer that's been spread throughout the body and you know is going to kill you. The, the sorts of things that, that we say about diabetes type two, you know, we say it's chronic and permanent, that it requires ongoing management that it's progressive and that means it gets worse, you know, it, despite all this management. And as it gets worse, you need more medications. You know, you, you could substitute medications for the word chemotherapy if it was cancer. You know, you, you need more and more as it progresses and it leads to complications. You know, you're gonna get symptoms and side effects that are not gonna be nice, uh, whether that's a heart attack, whether it's some um, blindness, some kidney damage, some numbness in your feet or pain in your feet. All these things are just kind of inevitable parts of diabetes in that model. Um, and eventually it'll kill you. <laughs> uh, grim, right? So um, that's the way that I was taught about diabetes. And I think that's the, that is that kind of medical model that we have currently. Um, and it's quite stark, but the alternative is reversal. <laughs> I mean, what, what could be more obvious to me, um, and it was to me because that's, that's the decision I made five years ago with my type 2 diabetes. You know, I decided that I didn't want this horrible set of things to occur, you know, when I was diagnosed at 37 and I just thought I've got plenty of time for all this to happen. <laughs> you know, it's going to happen if I don't do something else. And so... Um, Look, I guess there are going to be some people, and I guess if somebody's diagnosed at the age of 90, yeah, hey, you know, maybe it is too hard if they've got limited mobility and socially isolated to make these changes. Maybe not. I've actually got some patients in whom they, they do have limited mobility and are fairly socially isolated, isolated and have got one woman who's lost 15 kilograms who comes in on a wheelie frame every few weeks, you know. But... Yeah, sometimes for some people it is too hard, but given we should be giving people the choice, and I think that that this needs to be what we teach our our doctors and our public. We need to be teaching that this is an option. It's not an option for everyone, but it's probably going to be an option that a lot of people would prefer. Um, I think people just aren't aware of that. So um, yeah, you know, um, it was. Uh, yeah, it was, it's been exciting for him anyway. So I, I guess I sort of uh, beg as a question, um, you know, can my type 2 diabetes reverse? Because it's not always necessarily possible to come off all medications. There are some people who have, who just, you know, whose blood glucose levels don't allow that. Um, and I guess, you know, if somebody's got type 2 diabetes, uh, you know, that's, that's a question, you know, can my type 2 diabetes be reversed? And the answer to that is it depends. And the main thing it depends on is your own ability to produce your own insulin. Um, and, you know, there's two elements to type 2 diabetes. There's that insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is easy to fix. That's not an issue. You know, if somebody's motivated, they can go onto a diet like this and they can do a bit of intermittent fasting. It'll fix. And the other element is a limited or reduced insulin production capacity. 
and that's something which um, is, is the depends. And whether you can come off all your medications is going to be determined by that. Um, and the sorts of things that, the factors that will, that will um, go into determining that are the time since diagnosis. And I've put 10 years there, and that doesn't mean that if it's more than 10 years that you can't, because as we've heard many times with case studies, and the next one that I'll show you as well, is that it can be much, much more than 10 years and people can still have a phenomenal result in reversing their type 2 diabetes. But certainly if it's been less than 10 years, you can be pretty much rest assured that you're most likely going to be able to. Um, it also depends how severe your diabetes has been in that time. Because the thing with your pancreas' ability to make insulin is that not only is, is it limited in type 2 diabetes, but the type 2 diabetes is going to have a negative impact on its ability to make more insulin. So the more severe your diabetes is, the more damage your pancreas is going to sustain from that high glucose the more limited it's going to become over time. So there's that kind of spiraling effect of the diabetes itself onto the pancreas. Um, and then the other question is, is this truly type two? You know, in some people who are on insulin that are struggling to get off insulin, is it type one? You know, could it be um, LADA, which is latent onset um, autoimmune diabetes of adulthood? Um, that can be a slow progressing type one in adults. Um, and, um, and so in, in in type in uh, LADA, you know, you have limit, you, you have that autoimmune damage to the pancreas, so that your pancreas actually stops making insulin um, or reduces its production capacity. Um, there's a few tests that can be done to determine these things. C peptide is one of them, um, and C peptide is uh, sort of indicates your own ability to produce insulin. You know, it's a part of the insulin molecule that the pancreas produces. It's much more stable, so you can measure that level. And um, keeping in mind, though, that if you are on insulin, your C-peptide will be suppressed. And as you wean your insulin, your C-peptide might actually come up. Because obviously, if you're injecting your own insulin, you don't need to make as much yourself. So you can have a suppressed C-peptide. It may not give us the full picture of your ability to produce insulin. So, you know, it's always, if it is a bit on the border of low, I'd always reassure people, you know, who are on insulin, it's okay. It's likely to come up. Um, and also checking those antibodies to check whether it is in fact type 1 diabetes, GAD and IA2. Uh, keeping in mind that, you know, in some cases of type 1, you don't get antibodies. So somebody who's got really low C-peptide, who's got a really low insulin level, who doesn't have antibodies, maybe they've still got an autoimmune disease. You know, we don't know everything about type 1 diabetes. There's going to be some antibodies that we haven't discovered yet and autoimmune or destructive processes that we don't know about. Um, so it's really going to be kind of a suck it and see, you know, and um, the majority of type 2s can get that off medication reversal, but um, in, in my opinion, in my experience, I guess we haven't got those studies to confirm that, but that's been my experience. But sometimes, sometimes not. This is a really heartening case of where it was. Um, it's a 75 year old woman who had type 2 for 40 years and she'd been on insulin for 20 uh, she was on 100 units of insulin when I first saw her in a combination of long and short acting uh, insulin. Uh, it's 100 units per day. She could barely walk around her house. She struggled to get into my room. She was on her wheelie frame and needed someone to help her to get into the room. And leaving the house was virtually you know, impossible alone. And she could barely walk from room to room, basically. With five, within five months, uh, of being on a low carbohydrate diet, she'd weaned her insulin down to zero. Her HbA1c on insulin was eight, off insulin was 5.5. She was on metformin though. I had put her onto metformin um, as she'd come off the insulin. She'd lost 45 kilograms, and that was over the space, it's been over the space of about uh, perhaps um, nine, uh, 18 months or so. She can go wherever she wants now. You know, she's walking out of the house, um, uh, shopping, very independent, and um, basically has her life back. So, um, yeah, exciting stuff. Um, yeah, um, that's it. Thanks. Good morning. I'd like to thank Low Carb Down Under for asking me to speak today. I feel very honoured to be on the stage amongst such great names as Professor Finney and Grant Schofield and some of the other amazing speakers that we had yesterday. So I hope this lives up to the standard. 
So I brought three cases along today. We see all sorts of people. They come in all shapes and sizes. They're all ages. Uh, that's the nature of general practice. We see everybody. Some of our patients are wonderful. Some of our patients are challenging. So I brought along the perfect patient, the typical patient, and then the challenging patient. So this is the one we all want. She's a 33-year-old woman. She's a single parent. She came to us feeling unattractive uh, at 12 months ago. She weighed 89.2 kilograms. She'd been carrying that weight really since she'd had a little boy five or six years ago. Her BMI was high, her waist circumference was high. She'd had a recent relationship breakdown and was feeling anxious. Her only other past medical history was a little bit of gyny stuff and of course she's overweight. She was on the oral contraceptive pill. So together with my amazing practice nurse, Elise Prickett, who's in the audience today, we started her on a low carb, healthy fat eating plan. She struggled a little bit with the concept in the first month. Uh, I requested her bloods as I do on all my patients. She's a very naughty girl, she didn't get them done. Um, she also admitted to considerable alcohol consumption and I think a lot of that was due to the stress of her relationship breakup and it was a messy breakup with domestic violence involved, um, children's services involved and things like that. So it was a very stressful time in her life. She needed a lot of support and she came weekly to see the practice nurse and myself and with a lot of hand holding she got it. She started to lose weight. She's lost a total of 23 kilos now, and these are her, with her consent, these are her before and after photos. In fact, it's not quite after, that's, there's another one of her a little bit more recently where she's even slimmer. But that was taken in August this year. She's down to 66.1 kilos. Uh, she's very happy with her weight loss. She now fluctuates between 66 and 68. She'd like to lose one or two more kilos because she's not very tall. But you can see what her weight and BMI looks like over the last 12 months. And she's really made an incredible turnaround in her life. And this is her last week. She's looking very slim. She's feeling attractive again. She likes herself again. And she's ready to go out there and meet somebody new because she's still very young. And we, we're fortunate we've had quite a few patients like this. They're often young women who've gained weight in pregnancy. And I find they've often gained it quickly. And they do lose it quickly and relatively easily. However, we've all seen the more typical patient this lady is postmenopausal. She's a highly motivated lady. She eats, she came to us saying she eats a healthy diet. Probably if you looked at the guidelines, she lives by them. Last year, she was 113.2 kilograms on her healthy diet with a big waist <laughs> circumference. She has a bit of a past medical history, probably fairly typical for, for people of her age. She's had a cardiac arrhythmia in the past. It was benign, and she takes some uh, Sotolol, which is a, a rhythm controller, just to, to keep her heart rhythm regular. She's had a hysterectomy in the past, which is also fairly um, typical of her age group. She's had a little bit of mild asthma, and she suffers now and again from depression, which any of us who work in the weight management field will know is very common comorbidity of people who are overweight. So she's on an antidepressant, that probably doesn't help her weight. She takes her uh, serotide for her asthma and she's on a tablet to keep her heart rhythm regular. So when she came along to see me, she'd done it all. She'd done Weight Watchers, Isogenics, Atkins, she'd done 5-2. And anyone, again, who works in this field will know that this is a very typical presentation. Everybody who comes to you has tried it all and it's always failed. She brought a food diary along. It was perfect. She hardly eats any sugar, she had her carbohydrates at every meal, she had lots of fruit, and she doesn't drink alcohol. So why on earth is she 113 kilograms? So I did her bloods, as I always do, and you can see here uh, on her lipids that her triglycerides are 2.7. Uh, when she, sorry, when she first came, it was November, uh, her triglycerides were 3.4, and her uh, HDL is only 1.7, so it gives her a fairly high triglyceride to HDL ratio, which is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. I might change my practice after yesterday's talk, but up until now, I've been doing GTTs with insulins on these patients, and I do apologise to them because I know GTTs are horrible. But it was quite interesting because this lady has her level is very elevated, her, but it's dropped back to normal by two hours. So this lady embraced low-carb, healthy fat eating wholeheartedly. She's been incredibly motivated. She's kept an impeccable food diary. She didn't lose weight. She plateaued for three months despite her perfect food diary. 
We then added intermittent fasting. We were tearing our hair out a little bit, and I presume it's because of her insulin resistance. And all of a sudden, she started to lose weight. And by October this year, she's dropped 17 kilos. She looks great, and she feels well. And this is a slightly old photograph of her. I have a, a new one in a minute. So this is her, her um, graph of her weight loss. And I think it's telling that there was a little bit of weight loss in the very early days, the first week or two. And then she plateaued, and she just stayed there for three months. And it's incredibly frustrating. It's frustrating for the patient, and it's frustrating for the practitioners looking after them. All we could do was encourage patients and then add the intermittent fasting, maybe reduce her portion size a little. But they really weren't big, and she wasn't eating an overload of fat. And all I can <coughs> explain it by is that it was the, in the insulin resistance, and that the body has to take time to overcome that metabolic derangement before it's in a position to burn fat and help her lose weight. But she won in the end, and I have to apologize, she did another GTT specially so that I could bring it, and the results weren't back when I called yesterday. So unfortunately, I can tell you them next week if you want to know, but this is her now, and she looks amazing. She feels fantastic. She has a very busy job. She's really energized, and, and her lipid profile looks tremendously better. Her triglycerides are now 1.1. And her HDL has come up to 1.36. So she's reduced her cardiovascular risk status, and she feels great. Now the challenging patient. This lady is a 68-year-old female. She presented to me in May this year wanting to lose weight. Now there's a whole host of problems, and these started from day one. She sees another GP locally, and I have to say, he's not a believer. <laughs> she's done Weight Watchers. She's seen the dietitian. She's got diabetes, so she's seen the diabetes educator. She's ended up in hospital in the past with hyperkalemia. She's under the care of the renal team. She's under the care of the diabetes team. She sees her GP regularly, but she has flatly refused to see any more dietitians. So her past medical history is as long as your arm. She's got all sorts of metabolic derangement. She's been treated for hyperparathyroidism. She's got type 2 diabetes. She's overweight. She's got gout. She's got chronic kidney disease, she has it all. She's on half the pharmacy, <laughs> and she's allergic to the other half. <laughs> so as you can see, the challenges are mounting up for this lady. So I saw her in May. I, my practice is to do a screening appointment with patients first to try and screen out the unmotivated ones who really are not going to change. I don't want to waste my nurse's precious time. She's a very valuable resource, and I don't want her to spending an hour talking to somebody who's really not interested in listening to her. But after talking to this lady, I felt she was motivated. She did want to change. She'd had enough of being ill and being overweight. And her husband, well, this is the other important thing, her husband was supportive. He was going to do it too. He was going to do it with her. He needs to lose weight. He's got a big tummy, he's the, you know, the visceral fat, and he needs it as well. So with the support of her husband and the, her motivation, I thought she might do well, albeit she's challenging. So she was 118 kilos when we first started, and we gave her some dietary advice. She was on insulin, on Novamix. Now, Novamix, for those who aren't doctors, is a mixed insulin. It's a mixture of long-acting and, and medium-acting. Um, and immediately, I reduced her insulin by 10 units twice a day. But I counseled her that she was to test her blood sugar regularly, particularly every morning. And if her fasting sugars dropped, she was to take two units off her next dose of insulin and keep doing that. So she did that every week. So when we saw her initially... She was doing really well. She'd started dropping her insulin. She hadn't lost much weight, but she was dropping her insulin. However, when I saw her a few months later, I noticed her blood sugars were creeping up. She'd probably dropped her insulin a bit too quickly. I'm not sure. But she was then on, from 60, she was down to 22 units twice a day. Her own GP was really surprised. He couldn't believe that she could have dropped her insulin so quickly, and she hadn't really lost much weight. Her food diaries were excellent, and so I said to her, well, we won't drop your insulin anymore for now because her GP was getting twitched about her high uh, sugar levels. So on serial reviews, her blood sugar remained high and we went on a hunt for hidden sugars. We went through her food diary and there were a few sources that, that could go. There were commercial sources creeping in. We got rid of those. And she agreed to, she gave me permission to discuss her case on the um, Australian Doctors Keto Facebook group. And for those of you who are members and you are here, I thank you very much. Uh, I 
put it out to the hive and the advice I got from somebody was to stop the Novamix because it's very difficult to titrate. Switch her to Lantus, which is a long-acting insulin, and Bieta, which is not insulin, it's an injectable drug that acts on those gut hormones, the incretins that we heard about yesterday. So we started her on Lantus, I gave her 20 units a day, and Bieta, and her blood sugars did drop. They came down to the 7 to 11 range. I increased her Lantus a bit. Unfortunately, due to quite significant nausea, I couldn't in increase her Bieta. The, the desired dose is 10, uh, but unfortunately she wouldn't tolerate that. She, she was very good at tolerating the nausea. She soldiered on until the nausea abated after about three or four weeks, but I don't want to increase the dose. She continued to attend us weekly, and this week, I'm pleased to say, she's had quite a big weight loss, 1.6 kilograms in a week. Um, she's been seen, sorry, that was September. She's been seen by the renal physicians. They were generally happy with her. She'd lost weight, they were pleased about that, but they did think she was eating too much protein. So they advised her to cut back on the protein in her diet. So I said, well, you're gonna to have to increase your fat then. Her blood sugars are settling, her nausea was settling. And at this point, I think all we could do was just encourage patients. There's a great temptation from doctors to fiddle. We want to fix things. And actually, sometimes we need to just wait and let nature fix things. Her diabetes doctors wanted to fiddle. Her renal doctors wanted to fiddle. And her own GP is the hardest challenge of all. And he really wanted to fiddle. Anyway, she came back a little disheartened because she'd gained a little bit of weight. But this was because her GP had stopped her frusamide. Now, I don't know who started it. Frusamide is a a diuretic, it makes you pass more urine, and it's often used when you've got swollen ankles to help get rid of excess fluid. And I think that's why she'd been put on it. But her GP decided to stop it because he'd done her bloods and her kidney function was worse. And one of the side effects of fruzamide is it can cause problems for your kidneys. So she had very swollen ankles. She had fluid up to her knees. And I think that was responsible for her weight gain. I don't think she'd actually gained weight. She was just retaining a lot of fluid. Her blood sugars are now consistently below 10. Her weight has dropped. She's down to 109 kilos. Um, so I would like to stop some more medication. I think it would help her kidneys. I think it would help her. So I suggested she stop the Vitorin, which is a, a drug that lowers your cholesterol, and the aspirin, which is hard on your kidneys. I would also like her to stop the gout medication. She's had one bout of gout, and that was some years ago. And she's a lot better now, and I don't think she'll have another one. But maybe I'm wrong. And she's on a blood pressure medication called Telmisartan, which is also hard on your kidneys. So I think it may improve her kidney function. And the other thing is, I've got no idea what her lipid profile looks like, because she's on a drug that interferes with that. So if I could stop her anti-lipid medication, I'd be able to get a better assessment of her cardiovascular risk. And she's now 10 kilos lighter, and her blood pressure's come down. Unfortunately, her GP doesn't agree with me. Her renal function has improved since she stopped the frusamide, so I will give him that. That was probably a good idea. Her ankles are still swollen, which bothers her, but her weight's coming down. She has stopped the aspirin on my suggestion. She said she didn't bother discussing that with her doctor, and she stopped the aspirin. But she unfortunately did discuss the other medications with her doctor, and he won't let her stop them. So what are we going to do? And, and I'm, when we get to the discussion, I'm quite happy to take advice from the better brains in the audience than mine. My thoughts are that I'd like to stop the Vitorin for at least three months. Now, I, take, I realize that if she has a heart attack in that three months, I'll get blamed. But let's hoping that she won't. I really want to assess this lady's lipid profile properly. I wondered whether it would be worth checking her homocysteine. And, uh, and if she does need medication, switching her to a fibrate rather than a, a statin, which would possibly be easier for her kidneys to handle. She's now down to 107 kilograms, which is actually quite a significant weight loss. It's 10.2 kilograms, and she's dropped seven centimeters from her waist circumference, so her visceral fat is coming down. And if anyone's got any other ideas, I'd love to hear them at the discussion. But I, for me, the challenges of this lady are her co multiple comorbidities and the polydoctoring. This is her weight graph. So you can see she's, she's done it. It's, it's kind of stop, go. She loses a bit, she plateaus a bit, she loses a bit, she plateaus a bit. But really, overall, she's done remarkably well and, and probably much better than I ever would have thought she would have done. So I'll be interested to hear uh, what other people think uh, later on.